Can you hear me, my friends? Hello, hello. Okay, we're good on sound. Okay. So that would go in here. Here's over here. I got that. Okay. Now it should be the case. Testing. Hello, Michaela or Verdi. Could you give me the OK sign if you can hear us? Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, so are we live? Okay, everybody, uh, thank you for joining our live webcast today. Um, right now, Christy Simmons, uh, Pat and Gull, and Bryce Simmons are going to get on their gear, and you'll see them getting on the gear that will be used for taking you down under the water here on Little Cayman. We're going to be diving at a world-famous dive site called Bloody Bay Wall, and uh, we will not be diving on the grouper site today due to heavy currents. Uh, but we will be going down and seeing a ton of really amazing marine life that I think you guys will enjoy uh, quite a bit. So hold on tight, watch as we go, and in a little bit uh, I will start taking some questions from you guys. Spell it for me. K A T E. Video. She's not coming up. So it would come up as a. Yeah. Are you sure it's not Kate's video online? Because I have that. So as you can see, Christy is getting on her dive equipment, and Christy will be holding the camera uh, today. Bryce, uh, who you will hear in just a few moments, uh, is the one who will be narrating and uh, telling you everything that's going on. Hey, Todd. Todd? Yes, Verdi? Can you explain to my students just who Christy and Bryce are from a scientific research point of view? and the where they're from. Okay, so uh, Christy Simmons Pattengill is the head uh, scientist for REEF, the REEF Environmental Education Foundation, uh, which is has its headquarters in Key Largo. Uh, and then Bryce Simmons is a professor at Scripps Oceanic Institute in La, La Jolla. Um, and the two of them have been working on this Grouper Moon Project for the past 12 years here on Little Cayman. Um, both of them are active scientists and dive all around the world throughout the year. Uh, and uh, Reef's primary purpose is, is doing a fish census of tropical reefs around the world. And uh, Bryce works on a number of projects uh, at Scripps, including, including the Grouper Moon Project. Did you find her email? Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Gmail. There we go. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? I'm very excited about um, Bryce's diving so he can talk to you. <laughs> okay, so real quick, I'm going to introduce to you some of the other people that are on the boat right now. The um, wild man you just saw go across the screen is Neil, and he is a manager at the Southern Cross Club and a diver extraordinaire. Um, there he is right there. And then, uh, can you point the camera at Steve? And there is Steve Giddings, who uh, he runs NOAA. No, he's, he, he works at uh, the National Oceanic Atmospheric and... He is the director of science for their sanctuary program and has been working on this project for a number of years. Uh, incredible guy. And we have uh, Lynn right there waving at you guys. And Lynn is an intern with Bryce. 
a graduate, sorry, graduate student uh, with Bryce at Scripps. And then we have Ivan. And Ivan works with DOE, uh, which is the Department of the Environment here on uh, in Cayman. And now I'm going to turn over to Bryce, who's going to, oh, and Hal. There we go. There's Hal, who uh, is basically saved all of us on this trip. He's single-handedly fixed all of the underwater uh, dive equipment, which was not working up until yesterday or the day before. Um, and he has, is also uh, working as a scientist on the Grouper Moon Project this year, helping count and measure fish. All right, and now I'm going to turn it over to Bryce. All right, guys, can you hear me? Todd, can you uh, confirm that they can hear me on they this? Can, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, if I crank this down, it'll be fun. Okay. So as you can see, they're just getting Bryce's AGA mask on, and it's a special dive mask that allows him to talk while diving. Uh, any of you who are divers will know that as you're diving, you, you need to have a regulator in your mouth, uh, which prohibits you from talking. Uh, but his mask uh, is specially designed to allow him to talk um, while underwater. Clip that on. You can also see them working on this earpiece right there. That is what uh, allows him to hear me on. as, as they're what? talking to each other. Completely or? Yeah, it is broken, but for now. Working on a project like this, there are any number of things that, that pop up that we have to fix on the fly, which is what they're doing right now with that earpiece. Uh, we're also joined today by, we've got Cayman Prep High School uh, on Grand Cayman. And we have the center school in Seattle, uh, Michaela's class, Michaela Peterson's class. We also have uh, Kevin Stewart's class, I believe, at Spot Bay joining us. Welcome, everyone. So while we're finishing that, uh, we're going to show you the wiring that's the, all the equipment that we're using to work with you. So right here uh, that I'm pointing at, this yeah. is the console uh, that connects Bryce and Christy uh, to the top side. And they have this long yellow cord. If you show this cord that will actually follow them with the camera and the audio equipment, uh, there's 300 feet of it that will go down with them. Uh, to allow them to, to talk to you and for you to see what they're doing. Um, and all this equipment has literally been taken apart and put back together during this trip uh, as it was not functioning when we got here. We got zip ties too. Okay. Um, I, actually, while we are waiting for this couple of minutes. If anyone from the classrooms has a question, we'd be happy to answer one right now. Yeah, go for it. Okay, with no question. Go ahead. That's perfect. All right. Cayman Prep, we can take a question from you. Do they, Lydia asks, do you consider this, um, do you need a certain level of diving qualification to wear the mask that the glasses are on? 
Uh, Verity, can you say that again into the microphone? I couldn't make it out. Do you need a certain level of diving qualification to wear the mask that Bryce is wearing? Uh, you can hear me, yes? Yes, okay, great. Uh, sorry for all the technical difficulties. You do not need a special dive certification to use this mask. Although it's a very good idea uh, to spend a little bit of time in the shallows, maybe even in a pool, practicing with it first, because uh, it's a lot different than the kinds of equipment we normally dive with when we're doing scuba diving. The advantage is, though, that I get to be able to talk to you, and you get to talk to me while we're on our dive. So, as Todd said, we're at Bloody Bay, the Bloody Bay area of Little Cayman is one of the most famous dive sites in all of the Caribbean. This particular site is called the Mixing Bowl. And of all the dive sites on Bloody Bay, this is arguably one of the best. And so we are going to see lots of fish and coral when we get down there. If we get lucky, we'll see maybe a couple of grouper, maybe even a shark. So let's give it a whirl. All right, everyone, buckle your seats. Here we go. All right. So on the dive today, as Todd said, we've got uh, Lynn Waterhouse, who's a graduate student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She's going to be attending line with us. And Dr. Christy Patton-Gasevitz, Director of Science for Reef. She's going to be behind the side, the, uh... Okay. Are you guys hearing Bryce okay? Excellent, thank you. Okay, folks, here we go. All right. All right. Because in the 1600s, 
a couple of pirate ships and pulled into the bay and were cleaning their ships and they were caught unaware by the British Navy. They tried to get back onto their pirate ships but failed to get out of the bay and there they were all killed and it said that the bay ran red with their blood and that's how this place got named Bloody Bay. Why don't we take a look right here? I'll just point out that there is a, a fairly small Nassau group of, that's probably one that's just about reproductive age. Maybe somewhere between five to seven years of age. And this fish is of course not at the spawning site. He's here on Bloody Bay. But still quite friendly. Not too afraid of me, right? That's one of the neat things about this dive site here on Bloody Bay is there's a lot of those grouper around and it makes for a great dive because when you're not uh, spending your time looking at the beautiful scenery you can be spending your time having a pretty up close and personal interaction with the Nassau grouper that are here on Bloody Bay. Now you can see as we swim away from the boat the visibility is getting better and you're starting to see some hard calls like here and here's a brain coral right here. So you're starting to see some hard corals. And now we're coming up on the wall. We're just going to drop over the wall. Schools and schools of fish. So up here, I wanted to point out Black Durgan. I have Christy. Black Durgan. She's going to point to these fish here. Two different, well, actually several different species of fish here that you're looking at. The black ones that have their muscle and eating. Those are a trigger fish called black dragon. There's also a couple of different species of chromus and even a yellow tail snapper. Those are all plankton feeders, plankton pickers. So Bryce, we're not seeing much of that because uh, from what Christy's showing, it's mostly blue water. Okay, let me see if I can, I'm going to take it for two seconds. What I'm going to do, there, right there, that's a black turgon. You guys see that? Perfect. Okay. And behind it, that fish with a yellow tail, that is a yellow tail snapper. Here's another one right here. And guess what's there off in the distance? You guys see that one, right? Yes, we do. All right, he's going to come over to me. He's going to go visit me. Here he comes. Hello, big boy. Bryce, we're about halfway through the line right now, just letting you know. All right, thank you. So there's a, another Nassau grouper. That's a big one. Definitely reproductive age. Well, I'm going to give the camera back to Christy so she can shoot me, but... Guys, you can, you can kind of make it out, I think, in the video, but you see that wall? That, we're now at the wall. Yes, we can see it. Okay, here's, I'm going to give the camera back to Christy. I feel like I've been talking a lot. I wonder if there might be some questions that I could try and answer. Okay, so Cayman Prep, if you have a question about where Bryce is and, and anything that's down here on Bloody Bay Wall, now would be a good time. 9 wants to be While they're answering, uh, coming up with a question, I'll just finish up my thought about those plankton feeders, like the black durkin. Bryce, if you can hold on, I cannot hear the question while you're talking. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary. Mine wants to know what depth Bryce is at. Uh, Bryce, the question is, what depth are you at right now? Right now? I'm at, uh... About uh, 10 meters, or 34 feet. Not very deep. Not yet. We've just come over the lip of the wall. Wonderful. And what, um, Sam wants to know what depth do the group have spawn at? You let me know what I can talk to. Okay, so the next question, Bryce, is what depth do the groupers spawn at? Ah. Well, it's interesting. That's a good question. Those of you that were with us on the spotting aggregation site yesterday, now maybe I didn't point out how deep we were, but uh, that that dive started at about 85 feet in depth. We didn't get much deeper than that, but that's 
the shallow part of where they, they spawn. So they tend to spawn anywhere from about 90 feet of depth to uh, as much as 200 feet of depth. And that is uh, that's much deeper than they typically are in in terms of water. Oftentimes they're in much shallower water during their, their when they're at their home reefs. So they tend to go deeper than they usually are when, they, when it comes time to spawn. Bryce, can you tell them a little, little bit about why we are not at the spawning site right now and what's going on I there? I sure can. Um, you'll, you'll notice that I'm not picking hard here, right? I'm just, I'm just sitting and I'm not moving anywhere. I would not be just sitting and not moving out of the spawning aggregation site. Because right now, the water is really moving fast at that spawning site. There's a lot of current. And that current makes it very difficult and, frankly, not very safe to dive out there. That happens a lot at that spawning site because it's at the very edge of the western side of the island. So there's a lot of water movement. As water masses move from both sides of the island down, they tend to meet at that western tip of the island. It causes a lot of water movement from time to time. When that happens, we don't go out and dive that site. And it's especially hard if you're pulling a, a couple of long yellow lines so that we can talk to you. So instead we came over here. This is a neat site to show you guys, both because it's, because it's well known and it's a beautiful site. But also, uh, of all the fish that we tag, about 20% of them actually live right here. So what you're looking at, in terms of habitat, is the home territory areas for a lot of NASA grouper that live on this island. Here's another, speaking of that, uh, here's uh, another NASA grouper right now. Bryce, if you could motion to Christy to have her be a little bit above you, uh, painting the camera down cause the, for the lighting. All right, I'll let her know. She's going to show you this grouper first. And you can see that these guys, are, they're really friendly. You just come up slowly to them. They don't really mind you at all. So you can have a quick little pet. Maybe tickle them under the chin a little bit. You can even chill them too. There you go. There are your grouper. They just don't really mind divers at all. It's a really cool experience. There's nothing quite like a, a big friendly grouper hanging out with you on a dive. See if I can get Christy's attention and let her know. I mean, Lewis, get above me. Lewis has got a technical question about the mask. You need to be above me, shooting, shooting down at me. Go ahead. There you go. Perfect. All right. So, can we hang up with the group for some more? Came in prep. We can take another question. Go ahead. Lewis wants to know how you de-steam the mask. How does it, if it gets fogged up? Bryce, how do you get the fog out of your mask? Ah, good question. Um, this is my regulator. This regulator, this piece right here, brings air from my tank, which is back here, into my mask. That air, when it comes into my mask, it pushes up in front of the lens right here. It's kind of like how a, a defog works on your car. It blows air over the, the uh, lens of my mask. And that air running over the lens of my mask keeps it from fogging. Question? Johnny? Let's see. Right, I, I wanted to just finish up that thought about the plankton feeders. There's a big school of them right here. These are called uh, uh, Creole rafts. Let me what, what I show you up here. So there's lots of different species of plankton feeders on Bloody Bay Wolf. Uh, the reason why is because when you have such a large wall, it's very sheer. Water coming in from the ocean 
meets that wall, and you get a, a big push of cold, nutrient-rich water, it moves up from deep. And with that big uh, burst of nutrient-rich water, you get a lot of plankton growth. First, phytoplankton, or a baby, not baby, little plants, basically, that live in the water column, and then the plankton that feed off of that. So it's a whole food web. And on top of that food web sits these plankton feeders. And those plankton feeders eat uh, the, the plankton that's fueled by that nutrient-rich water. All right, Cayman Prep, we can take another question. Hi, um, Johnny wants to know how often do they see sharks? Right, so the question is how often do they see sharks here? Ah. You know, it used to be when, when I first started diving here about 20 years ago, uh, you'd, you'd almost never see sharks. Maybe every once in a while you'd see a nurse shark. Nurse shark is a shark that mostly sits on the bottom. More recently, though, uh, sharks have been seen very commonly. That's in part probably because sharks are doing a little bit better, as globally, the issue of uh, catching sharks and the fact that sharks are actually very long-lived and slow-growing has caused conservation efforts to take place. So perhaps uh, the start of a conservation success story. But it's also worth noting that the reason why we see a lot of sharks here on Bloody Bay recently is because people have been feeding them lionfish. Lionfish, of course, are an invasive species in the Caribbean. And like most places in the Caribbean, the Cayman Islands have been trying to use divers to control the populations of that uh, invasive species, which is bad for the reefs here because they eat a lot of the native fish. And, unfortunately, folks have been killing those lionfish and then feeding them to the top predators like grouper and sharks. The government has realized, and the researchers have realized that that's probably not a great idea, and so that's illegal here in Bloody Bay to, be, to do that. Nonetheless, it appears to be happening from time to time. And when you feed a shark, uh, they're not they're not dumb. You know, they realize, okay, well, I'll just stick around divers and I'll get a, a free meal. And so they stick around divers a lot and we see them. Hey, Bryce, do you think that you could point out a few of the gadgets that you have hanging off of your BC? Sure. Yes, I can. Okay. Well, to start, uh, I was telling you that I'm getting air from my tank back there, right? This computer right here, on my wrist, is actually communicates wirelessly with my regulator that's attached to my tank. So it tells me lots of information about how much air is left in my tank, but also how deep I am, and how much time I have left to stay at the bottom in order to not get too much blood and in my body. The reason my body and blood is a bad thing is if you get too much and then you go to the surface, that decrease in pressure lets the air bubble out. And if you get bubbles in your blood, you're at risk of getting things like clots and such. So anyway, all that is to say, this thing helps keep you safe. I've also got this. This is called a safety sausage. I can unroll it and blow it up like a big uh, balloon. So if I manage to get swept off or away from the, the boat, uh, I can inflate that. They can see me at the surface. And then, this is also another piece of safety equipment that I've got. This is called a PLB, or a personal locator beacon. When I'm at the surface, I can open this up, press the button, and it lets the boat know where I am. I'm going to show you another couple of species while I'm talking. Uh, these are blue tang here. They're a surgeon fish. You see them? They're really pretty. Really neat fish. When they uh, start life, they're bright. 
turned yellow their entire body. And as they turn into adults, they go blue with the exception of a little yellow spot at the base of their tail. It's called a scalpel. It's actually a very sharp spine. Named a scalpel for a, a surgeon fish by a fisherman who would get their fingers cut by those sharp spines when they brought them to the surface. Uh, a couple of little fish here. So there's big fish, like the grass on grouper. And there's also teeny tiny ones. Uh, like that uh, bunny, and here is right at the top there. That's a cleaning goby. So that's... Those guys are really cool, because uh, they have a really important role to play on the reef in actually cleaning the parasites and dead skin off of the bigger fish, like Nassau grouper and barracuda, which is really cool, because these big fish, they're, they're, they're often fish eaters, right? They eat other fish. But they also come in, sit very still, and open their mouths, and let these young, or not young, small cleaning fish service them. It's basically like going into a gas station. So they'll open their mouths up wide, and the cleaning gobies will go all inside their gills and in their mouth to pick out all the little parasites that are living on them. That relationship is called mutualism. What that means is both species benefit. The big fish benefit by getting the parasites taken off of them, and the cleaning fish benefit by getting a free meal. Lots of different kinds of species interactions on coral reefs. Mutualism is just one of those. There's lots of examples out here. For instance, like in these corals. Coral are colonies of little animals, little polyps. But what's neat is inside those little animals, there's actually algae that lives in them. And that algae living inside the animals photosynthesizes or converts the sun into energy that both the algae uses, but also the animals benefit from as well. Again, by getting a free meal from the algae. So, coral can feed in two different ways, typically. Both through of uh, the algae, or the zooxanthellae, inside the coral polyps, producing energy for them, but also they have uh, stingers that look just like a large sea anemone, that they're related. So if plankton comes by, they can grab the plankton and digest that as a meal as well. Let's see if we can... Are you ready for another question, Bryce? I sure am. Okay, came in prep. We can take another question from you. Um, Sam wants to know how does he equalize in that mask? Bryce, the question is how can you equalize in that mask? Sorry, go ahead one more time, please. They're wondering how you can equalize in that mask. <laughs> Well, you guys are interested in the, me in the mechanics of this, huh? Okay. Well, normally when we're diving, the easiest way to equalize is to just pinch your nose and blow. In the same way that if you were flying on an airplane and you're landing, you would do the same uh, in order to clear your ears so they don't get a squeeze. I can't pinch my nose in this mask, right? Well, this mask has two little knobs that push into my nose. So if you see me doing this, I'm pushing those knobs into my nose so that I can then blow against them and clear my ears in that way. So that's how I'm clearing my, uh, you know, equalizing as I dive. And I need to do that because as I go deeper, there's more pressure on me than on my ears from the increased volume of water above me. And that pressure on my ear squeezes the area of my ear that has a little bubble of air. So I have to blow air through my eustachian tubes with a connection between my ears and my throat by pinching my nose and blowing. And uh, just to show you another, another little resident here on, on, on Buddy Bay, 
This is a sea bass that they just went in there. That's a coney. The coney is what we call a, a meso predator. Meso predator. Now he is a grouper, but he never gets much bigger than about that size. We call him a meso predator because he's not a proper apex predator like sharks or large body grouper like NASA grouper. He's somewhere in the middle. Now, I folks had asked while we were out at the spawning site how NASA grouper maintained the structure and health of coral reef ecosystems. Now, one of the ways that they do that is by controlling the population of these meso predators. Here's another one here. This is a coney. Another small, small grouper. That's a coney there. So, NASA grouper eat those guys. Why is that important? Well, those guys, the meso predators, the little ones, eat lots of baby fish. And importantly, lots of current fish and surgeon fish when they're young. So, NASA grouper eat those guys. So, there's fewer of those guys on the reef. Because there's fewer of those guys on the reef, those meso predators, there's a lot more young current fish and surgeon fish. Those current fish and surgeon fish grow up, and what do they do? Well, they eat algae. Why is that important? Less algae, more coral. Algae is better at, at taking over space than coral is, but algae is also really tasty to, to herbivores like parrotfish and surgeon fish. So when you got lots of parrotfish and surgeon fish, you've got lots of opportunities for coral to grow. And in that way, you maintain a healthy coral reef. So that's one of the primary reasons why NASA groupers are important for coral reefs. And in general, top level predators like sharks and grouper. Okay, we can take another question from Cayman Prep. Um, they were very impressed by that last answer. They want to know what's the coolest thing. Uh, while we're doing that, hey, uh, can we take up a little slack up top, please, on that line? Yes, just one second, Rex. Right. Okay, He's just following us around the reef. Little puppy dog. Okay, Cayman Prep, can you repeat your question? Alexis wants to know what's the coolest thing that Bryce has seen diving. Okay, Bryce, uh, Alexis at uh, Cayman Prep would like to know what's the coolest thing you've seen while diving. Well, in all honesty, the NASA group of spawning aggregation here on the west end, a little Cayman, and, and I'm not just saying that, that is by far and away the coolest thing I've ever seen. In terms of big animals, I'd have to say, uh, okay, that's good for a uh, flank up top, we're good there. I'd have to say whale sharks. I've seen a couple of whale sharks in my life, and those are absolutely magnificent creatures. Something that's uh, rare to see as a diver, but, but truly a stupid, you know, that's a fish that's as big as a school bus. bus. Largest fish in the ocean. But it's also a plankton feeder, which is kind of neat. And then, of course, manta rays. Ocean manta rays. Well, those are very, very large uh, rays that are pelagic. They exist mostly up in the water column. And they can be 20 feet in length, very width. So, all of those, those big creatures in the ocean, as a diver, those are, of course, fun to see. Everybody wants to see those guys. And those big creatures tend to be the ones that go away fastest whenever you have uh, fishing pressure. Chrissy's pointing out here a, a tiger grouper. Uh, tiger grouper, like this guy right here, this is a pretty small one. They also spawn out at the west end a little caiman. So we've been talking a lot about Nassau grouper. Here's another species of grouper that will leave its home territory and go out to the west end to spawn, just like Nassau grouper. So that spawning site is important not just for one species, but many, many species. More than 20 different species of fish go out to that place to spawn. Just highlighting the point that there's something important about that location for the reproduction of fishes. Okay, are you ready for another?
to the question? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, Cayman Prep, I'm going to unmute you now. In, uh, if you have another question. Okay, my answer. Sorry, you accidentally got muted again. My answer that you're seeing now is morning. Good question. Uh, Bryce, they would like to know why uh, you're seeing the grouper now uh, here and why they're not spawning. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, I think I explained this uh, last time, but... Uh, so, Bryce, these, I don't think that this group of kids was on yesterday's uh, dive. Got it. Okay. Uh, so, we usually are pretty good at being able to tell exactly when the big month is spotting is going to happen. Uh, and it usually happens in January. If the full moon in January happens uh, to fall after the 15th of the month. So if, the, if it happens to be that the full moon is on January 27th, that's the month when they're going to spawn. On the other hand, if it happens before the 15th, the fish will spawn shortly after the full moon in February. If the full moon happens to fall around the center of the month of January, 15th or 16th, then we just have to guess. We don't really know what the big month is going to be. We guessed it would be in January this year, but the water temperatures have been very warm. Even though, uh, in terms of the conditions out here, uh, above water, have been kind of cold. Uh, underwater, water has been warm, and we think that's why the fish have not been spawning here in January. So, there are still about a thousand fish out of the spawning, but not the 4,000 fish that we were expecting. So, we're seeing fish here on the home sites because it looks like uh, there's not going to be the big spawning this month, it's probably going to happen next month. Okay, uh, Cayman Prep, we can take another question if you have one. We got a, another team of divers out here, I think Christy just showed you. Um, Andrew wants to know what the survival rate of the grouper spawning is. Excellent question. Andrew would like to know what the survival rate is of the, the baby grouper. Uh, that's a really good question. And I'm going to start by saying, I don't know. But then I'm going to get a question. Um, 
Who wants to know how long Bryce has been diving for? Bryce, uh, the question is, how long have you been diving for? Uh, I got certified when I was 13. And I'm 40 years old now. Well, what is that? 37 years. Oh, is that right? No, 27 years, sorry. Math underwater is hard. <laughs> Um, how do you know that... Well, I think this is to tell you a uh, blue head rat here. Uh, the one with the blue head? That's the male. These are the females here, the little yellow guys. Uh, now, you weren't here yesterday. We talked about uh, species of fish that change sex. Rats typically do that. So rats will be blue heads here will start off their life as female, the little yellow ones, and once they get big enough, if they survive that long, they'll switch to being a male with a big blue head. That male maintains a territory on the home reef here. So if you were to come back to the site a couple hours from now, that, that guy would still be here. And inside that territory, he means a, maintains a harem or a group of females inside of his territory. And he gets exclusive rights to reproducing with those females in his, his uh, territory. Blue heads are probably the most common species on Caribbean reefs in general. Certainly the most uh, often sighted of those species. Also plankton feeders. Okay, Bryce, we're about to get another question. Oh, okay. Um, hey, uh, how do you know? Take up some slack, please. What a sign? Oh, there's a bit of a uh, You cut out, uh, Verity. Can you chew that one more time? Um, what a sign that it's a healthy reef that he's on? The question is, what are signs that you are seeing here, Bryce, that this is a healthy reef habitat? Well, uh, healthy today's Caribbean is a, is a tough thing to define, because uh, even here in the Caymans, which, relatively speaking, has high coral cover compared to other places in the Caribbean, it's still the case that the Caymans have lost a lot of the coral cover they used to have. So as you look around here, we're still seeing coral. There's Chrissy's putting out some coral fish next to a coral. But not nearly as much as they used to be. That said, if you can coral here, as I'm diving with other places I've dove recently in the Caribbean, the amount of coral on, on the bottom, or the coral cover, is, is quite high. Now, why is it that throughout the Caribbean, coral cover is declining? It turns out we don't have a solid understanding of, of why. We don't know. There's been... Uh, the, the, one of the predominant thoughts is that as uh, the, the global temperatures increase through global warming, ocean temperatures are also increasing. And there's more likely to get bleaching events, so the water gets so warm uh, that the coral ejects their, their symbiont algae, the zoosan coral, the algae that live inside, and the coral goes all white. And if that happens for too long, the coral dies. And so maybe it's the case that due to excessive bleaching because of the warm water temperatures, reefs throughout the Caymans and throughout the Caribbean are slowly losing coral cover. That's one theory, but it's certainly not certain that that's the cause of it. That's a long answer to your question. But um, besides coral cover, big healthy animals like that Nassau grouper just swam by, and lots of species of fish, they're all good signs of a healthy coral reef. And as we talked about before, 
is ultimately connected to the stuff that lives on the bottom by doing things like controlling other species of fish that might be feeding on things like coral and algae and soft coral. We're getting into a big school here of fish. These are all yellow snapper and uh, goatfish. Yellow tail goatfish. They're yellow goatfish right here. They're very pretty, pretty animals. Okay, Cayman Prep, if you have another question, we can take that from you. They could be putting out some uh, snap right here, sorry. Just one's a dog snapper. And then, uh, yeah, we see uh, these dog snapper right here. That guy. Now, they also go out to the spawning site in order to reproduce. Sorry, go ahead, Todd, with that question. Uh, Verity, you are muted right now. If you can unmute yourself. Um, Nassau group of the Bryce's Sea. Sorry, Verity, I wasn't able to hear you. What's the biggest Nassau I still can't hear you. Do you want to type your question into the chat on the side? These are uh, three striped bugs you're looking at. Cut out again, Verity. At the spawning site, do the males wait and then the females turn up or are they there at the same time? So the question, Bryce, is uh, at the spawning site, do the males show up and wait for the females to show up before they spawn? Do the males show up and wait? Yeah, maybe if you could describe a little bit about what happens at sunset during that spawning. Ah, okay. Well, during the spawning period, shortly after the winter full moon, uh, all of the reproductive age individuals from around the island go to that spawning site 
and they will stay there. So they may swim around the island a little bit, just uh, looking for other individuals, but during the nights of peak spawning, every single individual will be at that spawning site, both males and females. And they may be there for as long as two weeks total, and during the course of those two weeks, they still are looking for the right mate, so they're scoping each other out, trying to decide which male is going to be the best father for the babies, and well, which female might be producing the best quality eggs. And then at some point, uh, for about three nights, all of those individuals will release their eggs and their gametes and a great, great, big burst of, of gametes, or a cloud of, of eggs. And the, that cloud of eggs actually is so big and so uh, thick that the visibility of that flight will go from more than 100 feet, or that's how far we can see underwater, to zero. You can't see because you're swimming in a sea of grouper eggs. It's quite an impressive phenomenon. All right, Bryce, thank you so much. Uh, Cayman Prep, if you can uh, yell loudly, thank you. He may be able to hear you over his microphone. Thank you. All right, you guys are very welcome. Thanks for joining me on this call. And thanks to you guys up top. Appreciate all the help. We're coming up now. Okay, and we are going to sign off now, Cayman Prep and everyone else who is watching. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, this live uh, webcast will be posted on uh, the YouTube site later today for anyone to watch. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Cheers.